Welcome, Joel. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Excellent. So let's start by defining、um, who is a consumer. Why do you always have to start podcasts by definitions? Just out of curiosity. Well, we need to, you know, paint a picture for our audience. You know, start broad and、okay. then go, go fair deep. Fair point. Fair point. Yeah. The best analogy that I could give as far as this.、Um, Or the best definition, actually, not analogy that I could bring、uh, around this consumer is a person or an entity that purchases goods or services、um, uh, for personal or household use、uh, or consumption. And this could be individuals who are buying groceries, clothing, electronics for personal use, as well as business, you know, businesses buying. Um, you know, such products or services、uh, for their own use within their business environment. But what was really interesting、um, in my findings、um, around the definition of a consumer is that the term consumer typically refers to someone who is purchasing goods or services from a seller, often in exchange for payment. And that was a golden thread that I got you know, across the board that was you know, quite interesting for me. So, the actions and decisions of a consumer、uh, play s a significant role in driving the economy and influencing、um, you know, uh, the production and marketing strategies of a business that's actually putting out these products or services for sale. That's a great, great definition.、Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, this consumer has evolved quite a lot. Um, in the past five years, the pandemic has obviously had a big、uh, impact. So, tell us a little bit about this consumer. How have consumers evolved over the past five years? And what did the pandemic、um, affect on consumers? You know, you say the pandemic, in my mind, I'm like, it's been three years already、yes. since 2020. I mean, let's just take a moment and、yeah. out of five years, three years. Yeah. Has just gone by. But you're right, yeah. I think a key thing to note here is the role that technology has played in shaping you know, the consumer's behavior at the end of the day. you know, Consumers have become more connected and informed.、Um, there's a widespread adoption of、uh, smartphones.、Um, you know, Social media platforms also have been adopted quite、uh, a lot.、Um, And they've enabled、uh, consumers to have access to inf- information and, more importantly,、um, interact with brands、uh, more easily. And this has led to increased demand for personalized experiences, at least from a consumer、uh, perspective, and the need to have. Um, needs tailored、uh, for the consumer has actually come into play. But what's really important, you know, over the last, let me say, three years, you know, during COVID, yeah,、uh, during COVID into post COVID,、um, the pandemic had a profound impact on the consumer. And what's really interesting in, in this scenario is that.、Um, Many individuals and households obviously experienced significant changes in their daily lives and also spending patterns.、Mm. Um, and the pandemic accelerated、uh, the adoption of、um, technology, whether it came to e commerce,、yeah. it came to you know, digital payment methods. Do you remember a time when shops started saying, We do not accept cash? Because of the pandemic,、mm-hmm. that for me was. I remember going to Two Rivers and wanting to buy food, and there were no tables at one of the burger joints that、mm-hmm. was there. And they say, We do not accept cash anymore, we're only doing card or M p e s a I mean, just think about that for a moment. Yeah, it's wild, it is it's wild, wild, right? Yeah, yeah.、Um, and then there's also a surge in demand for essential goods,、mm-hmm. you know, food. Housing supplies. Remember when everyone was shopping for toilet paper? I don't know why people shopped for toilet paper <laughs> during that time. You know,、yeah. um, you know protective equipment, s、mm-hmm. masks. I mean, I saw gloves. gloves. I saw our producer walking in today in a mask、mm-hmm. after contracting a cold a few <laughs> days ago. I mean, it's crazy now that you have a cold, you have to wear a mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah.、Uh, the effects but you, of the pandemic. But it's the effects of the pandemic, exactly. But、yeah. to your point,、yeah. um, you know, The pandemic also led to changes in consumer priorities and values at、mm. the end of the day. And, and many consumers started placing greater emphasis on health, safety, sustainability. And we are seeing this coming into play.、Uh, there's a growing interest in products and services that support these values. So, you know, we've seen a rise in eco friendly,、yeah. you know, wares, for、mm. example, products. 
you know fitness has become a thing how many gyms have opened up since the pandemic hit enough gyms like and not just in the urban areas i'm talking about peri urban areas mm, um, and yoga and exactly wellness has become a thing now mm-hmm. uh, and you know the pandemic has catalyzed all this so overall the past 5 years have seen significant changes in consumer behavior and priorities mm-hmm. um and with the pandemic serving as a catalyst for further transformation technology will continue to evolve and shape um this consumer landscape and it will be interesting to see how consumers continue to adapt and evolve uh in this landscape and what a time to be alive absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. absolutely um i mean you've talked a lot about you know the evolution of you know the consumer um how their uh, behaviors have changed how has this evolution um increased the differences amongst people there's definitely been an increased uh, difference among people as i mentioned earlier on the use of technology has enabled individuals to access wide range of products and services to communicate and interact with you know one to one interactions between individuals um you know one to many interactions with, from brands to individuals and so on and so forth um and what has happened as a result is that there have been new ways in in that communication aspect um and this has led to a fragmentation of consumer preferences and behaviors uh making it more difficult to make assumptions based off of demographic factors such as you know your age gender mm-hmm. earnings mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and location so it let me just try and paint a picture for uh you know for our our audiences in the past um it might have been assumed that um consumers living in rural areas would less likely shop online yeah. right mm-hmm. mm, you know you'd think about a consumer living in nyeri are they going to shop on line to buy a new phone that's on offer mm. on black friday think about it i mean think about um a shopkeeper looking to buying um their stock and rather than ordering rather than going to the distributor um you know that has changed because you can now do that online mm-hmm. um and you know that example for me just you know painted an interesting picture because with the rise of e-commerce and the increased availability of affordable smartphones and access to the internet that's affordable by mm-hmm. the way mm-hmm. and we have one of the most affordable rates in Africa mm-hmm. as far as data. internet as far as data is concerned yeah. exactly mm-hmm. You know the assumptions around demographic uh, profiling have completely changed. I'll give another example. You know you're wearing a lovely jacket today. Where do you stay in Nairobi? And I'm not looking to stalk you in any way. Lavington. Lavington. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you stay in Lavington. Mm-hmm. The way you've dressed up today, mm-hmm. you know, very smart, very uh officially dressed mm-hmm. uh for your occasion. Uh I'm sure you are influenced in a certain way to dress up in that way correct mm-hmm. yeah. you, you you must have had some form of reference that you drew from to be able to choose the sort of fashion that you wear now you're a woman in your 30s um you know living in lavington demographically that's how you would be profiled mm-hmm. all right yeah. now i'll take the same demographic profile mm-hmm. but same woman living in kileleshwa mm mm-hmm most likely your earning levels are pretty much the same given the neighborhood that you're living in mm-hmm. you you're both living in yeah. right again same age bracket um living within the same location um same gender all right demographically you're very similar however chances are that her fashion decisions her fashion choices would be very different from yours that means she has been influenced very differently in the way she would dress up mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and chances are that her points of reference uh and her desires and her interests would be very different from what you have so demographically We're you're similar. similar yeah yeah psychographically very you're different. very different yeah and 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 that's something that we saw the pandemic bringing out quite clearly because i remember when everyone was doing a uh, music they were listening to music on youtube it, everyone would be watching alternate sound uh-huh. the kenyan version 
and then it just and it suddenly just died down amongst certain groups of people and people moved on yeah but i can tell you till today people have house parties and still put alternate sound what does i mean what does that tell you from a psychographic perspective mm-hmm. their interests are you your same same demographic profile mm. interests are very different mm. right yeah so to that degree uh what we started seeing is that um experience has changed um and and the pandemic really evolved the way technology was being used um and as a result of that there was an increased difference among people within the same demographic profile mm-hmm. and it's important to recognize that there are still commonalities and shared values that connect individuals and communities um and understanding these shared values and finding ways to appeal to them can affect the way we create effective strategies for the businesses that we are involved in uh, and looking more importantly looking to connect uh with consumers in an increasingly diverse and uh, complex marketplace so that would be my take around just the evolution of the consumer mm. as a result of the pandemic yeah that's how i would look at it yeah yeah No that's really interesting very yeah. very interesting and I think you've brought out quite a few things um that are you know we'll delve into later and I think you know this um the psychographics you're talking about and the demographics yeah. really is around um you know data yes um you know you have a lot of more access to data a lot more ac- uh, data has been um generated mm-hmm. um and you know the data you get it from social media from emails from transaction behavior and mm-hmm. so many other sources mm-hmm. um so what impact has the growth in volume and velocity mm-hmm. had on consumers and brands yeah i mean i'll ask this question 3 years ago i mean you have been in the space you've been doing a lot of customer experience work yeah um 3 years ago how many brands were willing to have the data conversation with you Oh, not many. Not many. Not many at all. Not many. No. Uh, I can tell you for a fact <laughs> there are a handful of brands. Mm-hmm. Today I can tell you without a doubt. Mm. All the brands that I have worked with have an aspect of data needs that they are getting. And and to just validate the question that you put out the growth of volume and velocity of data available to brands has significantly uh impacted the way consumers um Uh, and brands interact uh and for consumers the availability of data has led to a more personalized and targeted marketplace experience mm. so in other words because consumers are now aware this is my data and you know this is how brands are tracking me um there's an expectation around a personalized experience um and i mean we've been talking about personalized experience uh with titans in the industry you know since 2017 but never has it come to life the way it has come to life yeah absolutely uh, so far um and as a result of that expectation you know this can result uh in a more seamless and satisfying shopping experience um for consumers um you know you, they can actually get relevant offers promotions delivered directly to them now however on the consumer side you know we've we've talked about consumers and brands so let mm-hmm. me tackle the consumers first so on the consumer side you know there's an increased expectation around personalization but there's a catch mm-hmm. now because of the increased use of data by brands it has also raised concerns around privacy um and more importantly the security um and consumers are becoming more and more aware about the potential risks uh, associated uh with sharing personal information or online now as a result of that many consumers um are becoming more and more cautious about the data they share and they're looking for reassurances not just from brands but also from you know phone manufacturers you know the apples the androids of this world um on how their data is going to be used it's going to be shared um and they need this explained to them in a very responsible and transparent way. Mm. So on the consumer perspective there's that and we saw companies adjusting to this and let me give an example. Apple um was it last year or uh-huh. last it was when 2023 yeah. in 2022 yeah they brought an update to their app store that all iPhone users will need to uh, uh, reauthenticate access of apps installed on their phone 
to get the right to access certain data points mm-hmm. as far as um, you know the usage of the apps are concerned so apps the consumers would have to opt in yeah. to receiving notifications mm-hmm. they would have to opt in to being tracked and so on and so forth mm-hmm. but that was as, as a result of consumers becoming more and more aware yeah. of mm, and know, pushing, back, and on pushing brands. back on brands now yeah. on the brand side mm-hmm. there is also yeah. a case to be made yeah. so for brands the growth and volume and velocity of data has enabled them to gain deeper understanding um and insights around the consumers behaviors and preferences now as a result of that we are seeing brands um becoming more informed around their decision making around product development around you know marketing strategies mm-hmm. around uh, customer service um and this can lead to increased uh, efficiencies and effectiveness uh, in their overall operations so don't get me wrong data has helped brands and data has helped brands in those ways as long as they use those data points uh, very well to you know responsibly and and yeah. as a result of that we've seen you know brands that have actually implemented those principles well we've seen effectiveness and efficiency and more importantly we've seen an increase in loyalty we've seen an increase in customer satisfaction because brands can now address certain customer needs at the end of the day now in similar fashion mm-hmm. there's a but there's a flip side to okay. it on the brand side uh-huh. now brands also come with ethical and legal responsibilities okay, <laughs> <laughs> there are ethical and legal responsibilities that actually come with it um when it comes to using using data mm-hmm. um and there's a need for compliance and you know applicable laws and regulations that they need to abide uh by now what i believe brands need to do is that they need to start being transparent and accountable uh for their use of data now speaking of transparency and accountability we can't do this podcast unless bills are paid right absolutely so <laughs> let's get some paid <laughs> do the honors our sponsor for this episode is johnny walker for this podcast actually um we have a black uh johnny walker black label uh it's a blended scotch whiskey um and i'll do the honors absolutely yeah let's pay these bills <laughs> there you go thank you and for me i think i can make a very good brand ambassador so diajo East Africa Breweries. Yeah. Uh thank you so much for sponsoring this podcast. Here's to keep going, keep working. Amen. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, that's a nice one around that's this a, time of day. Exactly. A nice a nice oiler. <laughs> very nice ni- very nice um social lubricant. Lubricant, I, I yes. Say. Yeah. <laughs> Now, as I mentioned earlier on, you know the responsibilities are actually taken up by brands mm-hmm. um and you're right you know there's been overall growth and volume um and i strongly believe that uh, it's important for all stakeholders consumers brands uh to be able to approach data use in a responsible and ethical manner balancing the benefits of data driven insights uh with the need for privacy security and transparency being applied at the end of the day mm. yeah No I love that. I love the way you've, you know, spoken about the benefits sides, yeah. and the obligations yeah. um for consumers and mm. for brands. Um so if we now go on the brand side. Yeah. Um and we talk about okay, what is a journey for a brand to de- to develop a buyer persona? You know, using all that data that you've just talked about. Mm. They have a wealth of data available to them. Mm. So how does a brand create a buyer persona and are there useful tools out there that can make that process easier? Yeah. Um Man, that lubricant is really genius. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Uh-huh. There are ways in which uh, brands can actually uh, take advantage of this. Um Developing a buyer persona involves a multi-step process um and it includes research, data analysis, uh it includes collaboration 
uh, between teams um you know there are typically steps involved in creating a buyer persona so the first step and allow me to break this down because you know, i'm actually you know my background is actually in software engineering so i'm a okay. very structured person very analytical and so Excellent. i would actually want to approach this in a very structured way mm-hmm. so if you can allow me to absolutely we want to make this as practical as, as possible. very practical as possible so yeah. the first step mm-hmm. um i think is going to be critical is going to be in the research side of things um conducting research to gather information on the target audience uh including demographics now because we know demographics is not enough we also include psychographics mm-hmm, data absolutely. there uh, behavioral patterns um it can also include other forms of market research studies that you may do around your brand uh it can include customer surveys focus groups um uh, social media listening is also an important part of it so that research aspect is going to be a very key part that you conduct and get as much as information on the target audience as possible the second layer to that is now the analysis of the data that you've collected from the first phase and here what you are trying to identify are patterns and insights looking for commonalities and in 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 behavioral interests looking for uh preferences uh to develop more detailed understanding about your target audience once we've analyzed that data and we've gotten those commonalities in those um uh, segments we can then go ahead and define the persona mm-hmm. now using the insights that we've gained from research and data analysis we can actually create a very detailed description of our ideal customer and that this should include the demographic information the behavioral patterns the motivations and the pain points or psychographics um to actually define that now a very important part of persona development uh, to your question is the refining and validation of these personas right more often than not as marketers we make this mistake of relying too heavily on data without necessarily uh validating this data mm. or sense checking or sense checking this data one to one in human human form and this is what forms this fourth aspect which is refining and validation mm. whereby we refine and validate the persona by sharing it with internal teams and gathering feedback and making adjustments Uh, as needed based on the input that we've actually received so it's important that in as much as we've collecting this data we need to validate this data and share that with our teams internally and then from there once that validation process has happened finally we can use these personas to guide marketing and sales efforts um uh and it's not just from a marketing and sales perspective but i think it's more important to use personas to develop products and services. Mm. We see a lot of personas being used in 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 marketing. The use of personas is used in marketing, but we rarely create products um and also customer service strategies, you know, using this persona. So it's important I feel like, you know, for us to be able to do that. So that's mm. that's something that I would I would I would go for. From a tools perspective, uh, some of the tools that I think brands can actually take advantage of to do this sort of uh five steps that I mentioned earlier on. Mm-hmm. Um you know, CRM is going to be very important. Uh it will help you organize your customer data, um the decision making that they've done over time within your business survey tools analytics tools persona templates and so on and so forth i think those are things that we can actually be able to take up you mentioned different uh, platforms that uh, brands can use to yeah. get information yep, yep. he talked about crm platforms yes. uh maybe you can define for us what crm platforms oh, are oh uh, my bad um a crm is actually a customer relationship management platform mm-hmm. um and so the way we i would define this is um it's think of it as a platform where you collect the information or data around your customer and it's stored there so certain certain data points that are collected are like you know what's the name of your customer what's their phone number what's their email address um you know what products have they bought um over the last 90 days are they a repeat customer is there a reason why they haven't come back and so on and so forth so it's a platform that really uh stores um 
information around your customer and it's proven to be valuable for companies that have really followed up at the practice of updating mm-hmm. um, their customer relationship management uh, uh, platforms. platforms yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can give us um, an example or mm-hmm. a use case of you know how Dentsu is using this data that you just talked about, this wealth of data you just yeah. talked about. At Dentsu, um, we have been able to uh, go into the market, uh, research um, uh, you know, people across you know different uh, towns, cities, uh, urban and peri-urban areas, uh, people from different walks of life, um, to really get a true representation of the population that we have uh, today. The other thing that we went ahead to do then is not just understand their demographic setup, but more importantly understand their psychographic uh, uh, setup. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, through this data, we've collected you know quite a bit, you know, invested quite a lot of money, obviously, you know, going through this uh, activity, and we were able to understand their consumption behaviors as far as media is concerned. We got to understand their motivations, their beliefs around uh, taking up certain products, certain services within the marketplace, and it has proven to be a gold mine. Uh, of information that uh, brands can actually take up. Uh, one of the examples that I can give is actually from our sponsors uh, oh, today. Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, uh-huh. Do tell. We sat down with um, uh, with the, with the East Africa breweries mm-hmm. um, to really understand um, beer consumption mm-hmm. um, in the marketplace today, and obviously. You know, beer consumption has had been on a decline uh, for some time now, um, especially for one specific brand. Mm-hmm. Um, we wanted to really get a clear picture of what would be the motivations that consumers would be able to actually take up uh, over time to consume more. And so one of the things we did is not just sitting down with the marketing teams, but actually sitting down with the sales teams Mm -hmm. to understand, you know, what exactly makes a consumer buy uh, your product Mm. at the end of the day. And so we defined certain um, uh, areas of transactions or points of transaction Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the brand. Uh, We looked at what they defined as the beer belt. Mm -hmm. Um, And... You know, within this beer belt, we are able to identify where uh, there's not just human traffic going there mm-hmm. uh, to those locations, uh, as defined by uh, as defined by the different personas that they have within their business. Um, we also looked at the motivations behind consumers visiting those areas. So, a lot of that was, you know, to get your social. Uh, currency, uh, social capital Mm -hmm. development happening, Mm -hmm. people, friends meeting friends um, over the weekend. More importantly, those locations were actually used as a convergence point uh, when it came to sporting events Mm. like uh, like Formula One and more importantly, the English Premier League. Mm -hmm. What was quite interesting about uh, this experience was um, when we looked at the sales data uh, from the beer belt, we noted that there are some locations um, where beer was being bought, transaction volumes were high, and there were some points where transaction volumes were low within that same belt. Mm-hmm. So what we then did was we took that sales data and then we layered uh, our comms data on top of that. And so that's where um, you know our our proprietary data sets came into play. Mm -hmm. We looked at what are some of the media channels that existed within that location, both online and offline. We looked at um, what were the psychographic motivations that consumers would have within that beer belt. Uh, We looked at um, messaging that was happening around that brand Mm -hmm. uh, within that beer belt. And what was quite interesting was the fact that within that belt, Predominantly, there were comms around uh, offers, um, and at the time, I think it was around it was a deal for Nyamachoma mm-hmm. and um, and, and beer, beer. Uh, if I'm not wrong, mm-hmm. um, and which was really interesting. I had nothing to do with the brand at all, but everything to do with the offer. And so, 
when we queried the research that we got, uh, one of the things that came out was that the uh, the, 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 the comms within that location, um, you know, really emphasized buying the the offer. But when you looked at the sales data, it's not really what drives mm. the sale. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's other moments that the consumer was experiencing to be able to drive that. And so the strategy that we went back to the um, EABL team was that we actually need to move away from promotional messaging to a more brand building messaging within that location. And this was um, a hypothesis that the internal teams had, but it was never verified with data. And so this was the first time we were able to go back to data and say, you know, we need to move away from promotional comms to more brand building comms. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing that happened. And then we realized where the um, locations where the, 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 the transaction volumes were lower around the same brand within that same beer belt, comms that were around that location had nothing to do with the brand. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, other brands taking advantage of that. So there was no um, mental awareness about what the brand had to offer, whether it's promotional mm. or brand building. Yeah. So what we decided to do is we took t- we, we looked at out of home data, for example, and you know one of the things M1 has done very well, it has mapped out all out of home comms mm-hmm. um, that we are able to then uh, lay on top of everything else. And we used out of home as a way to drive mental awareness around the brand. And then tagged those points of transaction with brand comms. And what was really interesting was that when we tagged that, it cemented the, um, the, 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 the notion that the brand actually really uh, supported me and really uh, understood me as a consumer during my moment of consumption. Mm-hmm. And so that alignment happened. But what was, what, what was quite interesting is in the locations whereby there was no comms happening around uh, the brand itself, we now started pushing promotional mm. content. Okay, yeah. And what was quite interesting is that the moment we started pushing promotional content mm-hmm. in the areas where the transactional volumes were low, we were able to actually bring the transactional volumes higher. Mm-hmm. And we then led social media listening data on top of that, and it confirmed the positive hypothesis that we had in our minds that brand building exercises actually goes a long way in strengthening the association between the brand and the consumer and therefore increasing the lifetime value of the consumer salience Mm -hmm. with that Mm -hmm. and whenever we ran continued comms around promotional messaging yeah, it's, it's promotion, 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 but for how long can you really run a promotional mm, message, right? Mm, yeah. And so we began to see a shift yeah. in that. And and I mean, that journey is still ongoing till today. Um, and I know there's a lot of testing and learning that's happening. Um, and we are really excited about the outcomes of that. So that's just an example of how, mm. um, you know, M1 data sets have been used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. I think some of the key things I'm picking up on is, you know, um, this use of data is, you know, using multidimensional data. Exactly. Um, you can't just take one piece of data. It's not effective enough exactly. anymore. Exactly, yeah, yeah. You need yeah. to layer. Yeah. And, and, and the, the example I use with data is yeah. that, and I, I always advise, um, uh, you know, data teams, marketing teams, strategy teams, mm-hmm. is it, data is like a, it's, it's like a fire you need to light up. Mm-hmm. You take one source of data, take another source of data, and then you like rub it together and then it forms yeah. a flame. Another, like, another big flame. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you, you know, you get interesting insights yeah. when you like layer different yeah. uh, data sets. Mm. And this has been applied on digital mm-hmm. in the past. Like, you know, for digital natives, it has always been a natural thing. But I think as we transition into a consumer who necessarily doesn't consume TV, radio, print, in silos but they actually are living in a digital fast environment consuming these mm. platforms consuming yeah. this content from these platforms it's important for us to learn how to layer those data sets mm. so maybe let me switch gears a little bit because we talked about data yes. the importance of data yes um you know the insight it's giving us about mm. our consumers mm. um but i wonder um is there a line between data and intuition oh, you know where is the line and have you ever been in a situation where you 
went with your gut feeling versus hard data. I need to have a drink for this. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, um yeah. You know it's actually much better when it's taken straight. Even Just without as an ice. FYI, without no, ice, no ice. It is actually really pleasant. I really like it this way. <laughs> um, so, to your question, um, there was this one brand that we were launching in Senegal. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a brand that actually operated in the quick commerce space. Mm-hmm. Um, they came to us with a very clear performance marketing assignment. Mm-hmm. You know, they want to run performance marketing to actually grow their user base they want to grow performance marketing they want to use performance marketing to grow their transaction volumes yeah. um brand has never operated in senegal before and so they came to us with this assignment and i remember i'll never forget um you know getting excited about the prospect of of doing this for a brand mm-hmm. i mean you know me i love performance marketing Absolutely. i like seeing brands grow yeah. um what was really uh interesting were the conversations that we ended up having with the ceo and the cmo Mm -hmm. at the time and i remember telling them well in actuality i don't think this is the right direction we should take Mm -hmm. in as much as the data shows us that performance marketing will always grow your your you know when you run search Mm -hmm. you know these conversion rates are are gonna be there if you run uh, google app campaigns you know, you'll get this number of downloads, mm. you, know, you can run remarketing for registration and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the things that was very clear was that it's a new brand. No one knows anything about this brand. Mm. And I remember the radical um, uh, a rebuttal we gave them uh, as far as our proposal was concerned was to just do video uh, based campaigns so that means tv mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and youtube yeah at the time and maybe facebook videos yeah um because the data said one thing but you know very well that in your heart of hearts your intuition is like people will not convert convert <laughs> you know yeah. in as much as we are trying to do performance marketing people yeah. will not convert unless they know mm. what this brand is about mm-hmm. so for us there was need for us to do brand building uh, at scale and 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 this was probably in 2019 2018 mm-hmm. 2019 um and i'm happy to note that you know the, the brand launched they they took up our advice and our model was actually replicated across other markets mm-hmm. uh for the same brand and so you know quite excited around the fact that they decided to actually follow the intuition that we had mm-hmm. uh, to be able to actually you know drive that but what was really interesting to that point is that uh, there's a recent report that was done, uh, you know, documenting how Airbnb mm-hmm. actually yeah. moved away from performance marketing and focused a lot on brand building. Airbnb, the brand that was known from before, mm-hmm. you know, moved away from performance marketing and purely focused on brand building. Yeah. And what happened mm-hmm. to their uh, to their growth? Uh, they saw, um, you know, more bookings and you know, people aligned to that to that brand value. Mm-hmm. And I see the same with you know other players like Booking.com doing that today in mm-hmm. the markets. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's really interesting to see how these things can actually be replicated over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, mm. okay. So yes, data is important. Yes, but also layering. Being layering is a key Layer, thing here. Yeah, layering your human intuition on top of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. The digital landscape is continuously evolving. Mm. You know, we've spoken about it here, mm. and you know, consumer dynamics present challenges that you know we must navigate. Yeah. Um, and some of those challenges are personalization versus privacy. Mm. Um, Consumers are now more in control. They expect seamless personalized digital experiences um, and they want, you know, things to be made easy for them to discover and shop on any occasion. Um, However, they don't want their privacy to be impeded. Yes. So how do we as uh, brand owners, as, uh, you know, marketing professionals ensure that our all the data activities meet our consumers' expectations on personalization and privacy. Yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge that balancing uh, personalization with privacy is a key challenge that brands are facing today. Mm. Uh, You know, consumers want their personalized experiences, um, as I mentioned earlier on. 
um, and they want them tailored to their needs and preferences. I mean, I expect that for the brands that I work, mm-hmm. I engage with, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but more importantly, I think for us to be able to ensure that all data activities meet our our, our, our consumer uh, brand needs, um, I think there's need for brands to prioritize transparency, trust, uh, and respect in the data that is collected mm-hmm. uh, from the consumers, obviously, and the use thereof. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's, there's some strategies that can actually help. So allow the, the analyst in me to come out. Um, there are certain things that we need to, to consider. Number mm-hmm. one, brands need to be transparent. They mm-hmm. need to communicate clearly and openly with their consumers about how their data is being collected and how their data is being are used. Mm-hmm. Um, I think providing this clear information uh, on the data that is being collected and how it's being used um, allows consumers to understand better mm-hmm. how these brands are, are, are using that information and it creates a certain layer of trust. Um, I think the other important thing that brands should be able to look at is look at obtaining consent. Obtain explicit consent from consumers before collecting their data and you know I, I think ensuring that consent process is clear and it's easy to understand mm-hmm. more often than not we see experiences where people go online and they are just told you know I've agree connected. to these terms and conditions and you know within those terms and conditions it's very clear yeah. and then you just you can't use the platform unless you accept yes and so on and so forth mm-hmm. so I think it's important for us to be able to to do that, to do that. but more importantly I want to believe that consumers should actually have an option to opt out at any time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At any time as a consumer, I should be able to say, I don't want. Yeah, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> so I think that opt-in, mm-hmm. obtaining consent, mm-hmm. and then giving the consumer the power to opt out, mm-hmm. I think is important. Uh, number three, I think it's also important for us to be able to provide control to the consumer over their data. Mm-hmm. We've seen brands like Google doing it now seen meta after the big fiasco they had Mm -hmm. apple obviously were the pioneers uh, when they did this and providing options for consumers to access edit or delete their data i think is really really important Uh, and respecting their choices and preferences should be adhered to Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. and then more importantly whenever the data is collected and which brings me to my fourth point how is this data protected Mm -hmm. right Mm um are those practices of collecting the data compliant with uh, applicable laws and regulations. Now in Kenya we have DPA, um, in South Africa we actually do have the POPI, yeah. um, mm-hmm. in Nigeria we have the uh, the GDPR equivalent there mm-hmm. called N. DP, NDPR, mm-hmm. yeah, um, you know, they have their own ways of doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to actually implement appropriate security measures to protect data uh, from unauthorized access or disclosure. Mm. And I think this is really, really important for, uh, 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 for brands uh, to be able to consider. They have to abide by um, the authority of the land mm. as far as that is concerned. Um, but more importantly, I think they need to also prioritize privacy. Prioritizing privacy and data protection in all business operations, Mm -hmm. every Mm -hmm. single business operations, uh, make it um, much more um, easier for consumers to trust brands. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when you apply this, not just in marketing practices, but in every other operation that you have, it's going to be important And, and, and make privacy a core value of your organization. It's one thing to say these are our policies, this mm-hmm. is what you, but if you have it as a value, mm-hmm. it's ingrained in your DNA as an organization, then it becomes very easy to ensure that all employees are trained on privacy best case practices. So overall to ensure that, you know, all the de- data activities meet consumer expectations, uh, brands need to prioritize transparency, trust uh, and respect. Uh, in their data collection and use uh, practices. And by doing so, I think brands can actually go ahead and build long-term relationships with consumers based on their mutual respect Mm. uh, and trust that has been established as a result of doing these things. The second challenge that has come out of, um, you know, this evolving landscape Mm. is consumers versus algorithms. Um, You know, we live in a digital first world where algorithms are the new gatekeepers to our consumers and consumer trust and privacy concerns are evolving 
data privacy laws. Mm. So what do media agencies slash <laughs> brands... You just had to ask what the agencies are doing. Well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're here on the hot seat. Well, I think even brands need to do something. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So the yeah. question is media agencies and brands, okay. what do they need to do differently? Um, yeah, uh, no, I agree with you 100%. Um, these concerns are real. Mm. Don't get me wrong. Um, we live in a world whereby, you know, the algorithms are the new gatekeepers. Yeah. Uh, and I think there is a role that media agencies and brands need to proactively take to build that consumer trust. Now, I mentioned mm -hmm. how brands can actually do that earlier on. Um, I think there are some strategies that, uh, you know, even agencies can take up. And, and we've, we've been able to do that even during our our studies, mm -hmm. you know, with M1. We are we're GDPR compliant, mm -hmm. uh, we are uh, DPA compliant, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we, it's part of our value system. It's embodied within our DNA. So number one, I think we need to prioritize transparency, right? Um, be transparent how algorithms are used to collect consumer data. Because we're talking about algorithms being gatekeepers, mm. right? Um, we need to communicate clearly about how this data is being collected, how a, a, a how algorithms i was about to say ai it's a different thing but yeah. you know how algorithms yeah. are are being used uh, to analyze this data mm -hmm. yeah. and how it can actually benefit the consumer and i think this can help establish a positive relationship with our consumer base um and this applies for both brands and agencies i think there's need for us to embrace the reg regulations as i mentioned earlier on uh, getting those regulations in place we need to foster consumer education and it's it's constant education around how these algorithms work um many a times we see consumers getting empowered uh, to make informed decisions about how their data is being used and as a result how they can actually understand the data privacy um i think it's also important as agencies to start looking at building ethical algorithms Mm, okay. um, you know, building ethical algor algorithms that really prioritize on fairness, uh, prioritize on transparency, tr prioritize on consumer privacy. Mm -hmm. um, it's important. And uh, it's not just building them, but also conducting um, regular audits mm -hmm. on the builds that you've made, on the models that you've built to ensure that algorithms really are aligned with our ethical principles that we live by. Mm -hmm. um, and I see the same standard now being applied in artificial intelligence because we have ethical AI becoming a very big part of, of, of what we do. And I have, I mean, I can go on and on and on and talk about some of the scary examples that mm. we've seen yeah. but it's really interesting to see how this is but to, to your question um you know media agencies and brands can actually you know, you know take up some of these things that i mentioned earlier on. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah i think that's a great um you know uh, segue also into as we are moving into ai we'll yeah. get to that point ah, in a moment okay. got it got it got um it. definitely we can't do this uh, show without we can't have an just wait yes consumer listener we can't have an eye marketing podcast if we don't talk about AI. Just as a, as an FYI. So stay tuned. Have you seen what I've done there? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about trust. You've talked yeah. about trust um, quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so the 2020 Edelman Trust Barometer reports that 78% of consumers surveyed um, say they will advocate. Uh, recommend and defend a brand that they trust. Mm. So d how do marketers build trust for brands in an era where data is a big driver in the dissolution of trust? Um, maybe you can give us an example, you know, from the continent of how you've seen a brand build trust um, and loyalty. Yeah, I think um, that 2020 uh, report was actually quite interesting. And I, a lot of... Um, the answers that are were, that I've given actually referenced um, the report. So when we talk about uh, you know prioritizing transparency, protecting the data, uh, you know fostering engagement with your customer, um, and then focusing on value delivery uh, through personalization and relevant marketing messaging, um, these are ways that you know marketers can actually leverage off of off of. Um, trust building uh, activities are concerned. So an example I can give, um, 
of, of how brands have leveraged on you know this trust ecosystem that you know we've been talking about mm. um is this one specific brand in South Africa that was actually a an insur- they started off as an insurance company they would provide a lot of health insurance to their customer base mm. but then evolved into other forms of financial services which you know were included but not limited to banking services mm-hmm. um i think they got their banking license they are doing a lot of credit debit uh, card um, solutions mm-hmm. really interesting fintech solutions but they initially started as a healthcare insurance company mm-hmm. what was really interesting about this brand is i remember a couple of years ago they introduced an application um, to their uh, to their customer base So if you are a customer of this uh, insurance company, you'd get an app. And the app would be primarily used to track your activities, your physical activities. Mm-hmm. So how many steps have you taken? Um, you know, what have you eaten? And it it really encouraged a fit lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, by them doing that, mm-hmm. already they are collecting your data. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember around this time I think it was back in 2018 mm-hmm. they had actually prompted their customer base that you know this is the data that we will be collecting over time. Mm-hmm. What's really interesting up to me about how they ended up um re uh investing this data set into their service offering was that based off of your physical activity so how many steps did you take mm-hmm. uh when you went to the gym what activities did you do you know record the number of burpees you did mm-hmm. oh for how long were you on the treadmill yeah. how many k's did you run mm. were you cycling you know were you walking you know yeah. exactly what your smart watch would do today mm. they created an app for that mm-hmm. what was interesting is that they took that data and then reinvested it in the in in their in their service offering and they said based off of your physical activity because we know your lifestyle your premiums would vary based off of your physical activity in other mm, words yeah. the more physical you are as a human being mm-hmm. the more the less likely you will you know fall ill yeah mm-hmm. and as a result of that mm-hmm. we can vary the premiums mm-hmm. that you pay as a consumer yeah. over time based off of your physical activity and so this was a very interesting way in which data was used to build a brand offering and then as a result of them building the brand offering it benefits the user mm-hmm. because as a consumer I'd be like huh i want to play, pay less premiums for me to pay less premiums i need to be more physically active mm. which is a win win which is a win win yeah. you see how it builds um a better customer experience yeah, and i'm more likely going to be loyal to this insurance company mm-hmm. because of how we do it our actuarial models in this market actually don't allow us to be able to do that and i sincerely mm-hmm. hope and i speak to the actuarial community right now mm-hmm. i sincerely hope that we actually take um advantage of data sets that exist today telcos financial services um mm-hmm. and even now in the healthcare sector yeah. There's a lot of data that's being collected. Let's use that data to create better customer experiences, better products, better services for for Kenyans in general. Mm. And I hope that I know someone within the government can actually watch this podcast because I think it's a very interesting way we can actually use data to build trust mm. uh, for consumers from a brand lens perspective, mm. yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, you've, you know, hit the nail on the head. I think, you know, data can be used to really create a delightful experience yeah. and to really solve actual customer needs and customer problems. Yeah. So definitely um thank you so much for that example and for um really uh, honing in on that point. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>